here to talk about the challenges, the opportunities, and some best practices related to just transition and what economic inclusion looks like in a clean energy future. Transitioning countries away from fossil fuels towards clean energy requires that we put people and community at the center of our solutions. This is not always easy to do. As governments and industry expand different technologies uh, from my spot, uh, into communities, they need community support and buy-in. This panel will explore the challenges and opportunities related to a just energy transition in the U.S. and highlight key cities where unlikely allies came together to find common ground on clean energy solutions. We are joined by two panelists, Dr. Mark Berry, VP of Research and Development at Southern Company, and Robert Cabrera, President and COO of Sync AI, Sync Energy AI, also one of our founders of the Green for All Business Council. So we're very excited to hear their perspectives. Um, and so I will actually start with having them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your background. I'll start with Dr. Berry. I'm going to say it took me how many miles a week, a week from the United States? About 8,000. About 8,000. So, this is my friend Robert. We actually live really close together in Atlanta, but it took us 8,000 miles to, to find each other. That's right. <laughs> so, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Berry, and as Jesse mentioned, I work for Southern Company. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about me, I am from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I went to a historically black college and university in Huntsville, Alabama, and then I went to Officer Candidate School and joined the United States Navy. I always wanted to, when I was at AM, I got a math degree, I always wanted to be an engineer. So after four years in the Navy, uh, I requested to get out and go pursue my doctoral degree in engineering, which I completed at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I did that while I was working. While I was in school, I had an instructor uh, that was teaching a class on power plant technology, and he was one of the leaders in research for a Southern Company. Jeff, I think I'm in the wrong spot. Oh, I did a little shifting. Yeah, 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 we'll see if we can, see if we can find the, the right spot. But that's how I got engaged with R&D, which is by a happenstance. So Matt and I were talking earlier and he was talking about how he got a nuclear and it was happenstance. So I guess this is how my idea is. Uh, so I worked in R&D for many, many years. Uh, I then went over and started doing policy work. Uh, so I did that for a few years and actually left Southern, went to the Electric Power Research Institute as a director of the generation sector and rejoined Southern Company as a compliance officer at George Power Company, which is the largest kind of affiliate uh, within within Southern. Uh, three years ago, they asked me to go back and start working in R and D, and this is my first talk. Maybe we project. Yeah. So I am a husband and a father. So I have four kids. My daughter is thirty-four. I have a son that's twenty-eight have a son that's 22, and I have my youngest son is 15. I'm really excited about being here at COP. This is my first one. I'll tell you the thing that has fascinated me the most is the diversity of the people here on, on this issue. So I had the opportunity to go into the blue zone for, for two days, and actually got to go and see all of the countries. And it was interesting to see the different languages and the different cultures, how people kind of are coming here and sharing their perspectives. And I'm just excited to be here on this panel. And uh, I'm super excited to get back to Atlanta and hang out with this guy. <laughs> yes. Um, my name is Robert Cabrera, um, founder President and CEO of Sync Energy AI. Uh, originally from Rwanda, a small country um, in East Africa. And uh, uh, my parents actually from uh, the part of Rwanda where the gorillas are. 
And so if, if you're familiar with gorillas, when I was younger growing up, grandmother would say, hey, there's a crazy white woman playing with monkeys. We, we thought grandmother was just possessed. It turns out it was uh, Diane Fossey. <laughs> that's, that's where I was born. And in uh, and, uh, 94, my country had a small misunderstanding. And as a result, uh, I spent six years in refugee camps in the Congo, Uganda, and finally Botswana. So my interest in energy uh, stems from those six years of being in the darkness. Uh, that's my obsession with the grief that has been for a long time. Moved to the US in 2000, uh, studied engineering at Stanford, uh, graduated in 2011, did some work with the Obama administration under Power Africa. I got a chance to work with 50 energy companies in African countries. Um, it became clear to me that uh, one of the big issues to energy was uh, access to finance. So I started a credit scoring company and then uh, discovered that the most credible people are smallholder farmers. So I spent four years in Ghana working to build a bank for smallholder cocoa farmers. And uh, three years ago, I linked up with a friend of mine from grad school. He said, hey, remember seven years ago, we built that tool that can use satellite imagery to predict hurricanes and wildfire impact on the grid. I said, yeah, we started the company and uh, that's what we do now. That's, that's my basis. And what I wanted to say was, uh, I was at Stanford for homecoming two weeks ago and they just got $1.7 billion for a new school of sustainability. And uh, 12 years ago when I graduated, it was all about Instagram and Snapchat, but now they're gonna commit that whole school to do climate science. So I think the timing is good. And I was the only person crazy enough to do climate work. So they honored me as the alumni of the year for the wow. new school. Yeah. And so the, 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 the timing for what we're talking about here, the Silicon Valley is also on our time. So I think we can definitely, that's what I'll talk about in my comments. How do we leverage technology to really make efficient progress in this space? Thank you. Great, thank you. So now you can see how esteemed and illustrious this panel is. Our first question is, what does a just energy transition look like to you? And I'm happy to see whoever wants to jump in first. Okay, I'll go. Okay. I'll go. Uh, so as my friend said here, is it's that there is a diverse group of people here. And oftentimes when there's a diverse group of people, we make the assumption that when we're speaking about a concept, such as the word just, this is a just and transition, we're talking about the same thing. In reality, if I ask everyone in this space what just means, it means a completely different thing. So I wanna start by explaining what that fundamentally means in this situation, uh, what the word just means. And it means keeping in mind the list among us. And I'm gonna describe what the list among us means with three short stories, 30 seconds each. Story number one is about a candlelight in a refugee camp. Story number two is about a smallholder cacao farmer. And story number two is about low income people during hurricane season in the American South. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, spent years in refugee camps, three years of those were in Botswana in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. It's so hot in the Kalahari Desert that 100 degrees Fahrenheit outside, people are wearing blankets because they're freezing. So the desert is in the middle of nowhere. And if I needed to study uh, after dark, I studied on a kerosene lamp. And so I specifically have, my aha moment in energy came in one of those experiences. As an immigrant kid, you are bullied. And the only way you justify your presence is by doing well in the classroom. So it's night time, I'm studying on the log on a kerosene lamp, and at night, the breeze keeps blowing the kerosene lamp out. Out of frustration, I stop, I look up in the sky, and I see an airplane fly by. And I ask myself two basic questions. Number one, how do we get light down here for everyone? Just like that airplane. And number two, how do we keep that light on so that it doesn't keep going off like this kerosene lamp? So that is question number one, the world has 90 million refugees. Four million just in Sudan next door. How do we ensure those people have access to light? 
The second story is smallholder farmers, right? Something like 80% of Africa's population is farmers. Um, climate impact for them goes as follows. Ghana grows 20% of the world's cocoa. If you like chocolates, you got to know about it. They depend on rain for their crops. When the rain is one month late, a farmer is already making a dollar, two dollars a day. But when the rain is 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 uh, one month late, their productivity goes down by forty percent. Their yield in one season, right? But if they happen to use a solar-powered irrigation system, their yield, which is around four hundred kilograms per hectare, goes up to four thousand, ten x. How do we make sure every farmer has access to a solar-powered irrigation system? And number three is about, we're seeing more and more disasters in the South. Hurricanes, obviously in the South, wildfires on the West Coast. And when those people experience hurricanes, it takes days, sometimes weeks for the power to come back on. This is in triple degree temperature. How do we ensure that those people have the power on when they need the most? Or like what happened in Texas in February, people died because of a freeze. How do we ensure that? And so when I say the least among us, I mean the refugee kid studying at a kerosene lamp in Botswana, the smallholder farmer in Ghana that needs solar to maximize productivity, and the low income resident in Louisiana or Texas that either is burning because they don't have access to electricity or they're freezing because a random freeze just happened. That is what it means to me. So that that mother in Texas doesn't have to choose between paying her electricity bill and the house freezing. If you had the same choice, what would you choose? A freezing house on empty stomach. How do we make sure that people do not have to make that decision? That's what a just energy transition means to me. Man, I wish I had stories like that. <laughs> <laughs> you got better stories. I don't, I don't think so. So, uh, my job responsibilities require me to think about the future of energy. And that's actually the vision of the organization that I lead, creating the future of the energy. And it makes me think about a movie. I think some of you may have seen, and the name of the movie is There Will Be Blood, I think is the name of this movie. And it's about discovering a oil in Texas. And it makes me think about the energy infrastructure that we have in the United States. And something that I think you said, you talked about Stanford and having that technology mindset. When we started in the United States building our infrastructure, I think we had a view of technology and then a view of finance. When I think about the just transition, I think we have to add a third pillar, which are people. Right, and one thing doing the analysis as an energy researcher, you look and you see that you look at electricity, you look at the industrials, you look at transportation. And it is evident to me, in order for us to meet net zero by 2050, that as a society, we'll have to create a new energy ecosystem. Right, that is what we're doing, whether it's renewables, whether it's hydrogen, we're going to replace or augment the infrastructure with something new. Now we can think about it in terms of technology and finance, but now we have the opportunity to think about it in terms of people and what those two things have in terms of the impact to people. So we need to change our mindset to be not just, hey, are we gonna use electrolyzers? Are we gonna use wind? Are we gonna use solar? But think about how these technologies kind of interface with people. So we need to close the loop. And we have to think about all different types of people. Uh, so I had an opportunity this week to go to a dinner and I got to hear a very thoughtful person, thoughtful man, talk about finance and financing wind resources, for instance. And we talked about it and we talked about returns, but we never really talked about the returns for people. 
Right, so how do we start that conversation? How do we include more and different points of view? So I don't know what the tr just transition is for every country. So we're here at COP, and when I was walking in the blue zone, I saw so many different people. And one thing that I have learned over my career is that energy is local. And you have to have that local mindset. So yes, it is technology, and it is finance. It's local, and it involves people. So how do we interact with people on a local level? So Robert, my friend here, talked about, you know, growing up with no lights. That is a local perspective. It is a very relevant perspective for the locality in which he live and where people, where he is from, how they live. Where I am in Atlanta is something totally different. We're both trying to get to the same place. We're likely going to get there different, but we can't forget people. So for me, just transition means adding technology, finance, and people. Thank you. Thank you. So again, as experienced professionals in this field, as we transition to a clean energy economy, what are the biggest challenges, misconceptions, or misunderstandings that exist around clean energy technologies that keep people divided? So yeah, as we are actually transitioning into the clean energy future, what are the common misunderstandings related to clean energy technologies that keep people divided? Yeah, I think for me, what I see is that there are maybe technology favorites by a specific group, whether it's Hey, I work for electric utility. We may like nuclear energy, for instance, and some may not like nuclear energy. Some might be pro-solar or pro-wind. So I think we have to kind of widen our point of view. Jesse, you talked about how can we have a conversation about different things. I think we're all trying to get to the same place. But one of the challenges that I see is that we miss each other, right? Because we have a point of view of what we think the final answer is, right? But the final answer is net zero. If we're trying to get there, we're trying to combat climate change. I think we need to be a little bit more open-minded to hear what other people have to say, different points of view. Yeah, I think to me, um, uh, there are sort of four things that come to mind with that question. And uh, number one, it's a concept here in Africa known as Ubuntu. You are because I am. How can I relate to you? And in energy in particular, there's a concept called energy poverty. Energy poverty, simply put, is how much percentage of your income do you spend on energy? And if you're above a certain average, you're in energy poverty. So in the US, it's 6%. If you spend more than 6% of your monthly income on energy and poverty. On, on the, in Africa, on average, it's 30%. If you spend more than 30% of your income in energy poverty. So how do you sort of understand someone's financial obligations at that level and build the transition with that in mind, right? Um, and Dr. Barry talked about um, technology has favorites. Uh, when I was at Stanford two weeks ago, I attended a seminar where the professor presented a study on California is investing heavily on undergrounding, right? Many of the wildfires are caused by overlying lines, so they want to underground. And the study on undergrounding, juxtaposition with income, had amazing results, right? So it turns out that low-income communities in California have a much older grid that is ill-maintained. It turns out those same people in low-income communities have the most dense forest near the power line. It's a risk. It also turns out they have the oldest equipment, right? And they also experienced the most and the longest power outage. This is just comparing regular energy matrix with people's income. So how do you deliberately keep that in mind when you engineer a system? And the third area uh, I'll talk about uh, is, is reimbursement, right? Whenever there is a disaster in the US, you're reimbursed by FEMA. 
which is great if you're a company because you can use that money to cover your cost. There are studies at North Carolina State University that show that communities that do receive those FEMA reimbursements stay in that state much longer than those that don't. It's crippling. So those reimbursements favor the private sector, they cripple the community. And the last area I want to sort of point out to is what affects each one of us. We all drive, transportation, you know. Uh, every state has goals to get to particular goals by 2040, right? It's a great goal, but many, 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 many sort of shortcomings. Some of the ones I wrote was uh, alternatives to uh, fossil fuel cars are slow and expensive, right? By raise of hands, how many people here drive a Tesla? Two, <laughs> right? I mean, so, I mean <laughs> yeah, that, that's an example of the disconnect. If, if we can be part of that here, what about everyone else, right? Uh, and more importantly, while the, 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 the small electric vehicle revolution has come, the trucking space is nowhere to be found, right? There are no commercial manufacturers of trucking vehicles um, and for transportation, agriculture, and heavy equipment. And we depend on those. And so that area is far behind. Um, and so the other problem is, of course, the battery itself, right? It has a range issue. And in cold places like Canada, evidently, when you turn on your uh, heating system, your range is shorter. So you gotta decide between freezing while driving versus staying warm, right? And, and, and the last part is the infrastructure. Uh, hard to be able to find infrastructure, especially in sort of low income areas. And you spoke of hydrogen. Um, you know, the use of hydrogen is great, but it, it's far behind electric vehicles and, and really lagging. And so I wanted to really elaborate that transportation sector because it's, I think, the most common area that touches everyone. And so until we think about some of those challenges and engineer them, I think meeting those goals will be awfully difficult. Mm. So just can I jump in here? Yes. I really like what you, what you talked about. So I really like the, you and I to talk about transportation. So one thing, so at Southern, uh, we just established a equity researcher. And we had a project that we did with the Electric Power Research Institute and SEPA here recently where we were trying to engage communities in different types of engagement around electric transportation. So these would be individuals who could not afford a Tesla. And one thing that I'm passionate about is, so I live in Douglasville, Georgia, which is outside of Atlanta. When I'm going to work, I go down the road and I look over to the right, there's a Target, right? Many of us know about the red dot in the United States and they have a Tesla kind of supercharging area. <coughs> and I think about if someone's driving <coughs> on the freeway, they can see within their Tesla where they can go get some juice, right? That makes sense. If you talked about investment in communities, if utilities are not purposeful in where they put new technology like chargers, then a Tesla person could pass by communities of color if they don't have that infrastructure. They don't do business there. There's no like economic investment. And when we did this project, it was, hey, we just want to have some giveaways, talk to people, see what they think about electric transportation. And what we found was that, and maybe they're not as informed as they need to be, but there's an interest. So how do we be able to, in this new energy infrastructure, not do the triple down approach where it starts in one higher income community and then over 20 years, you know, it gets to other communities. And we're gonna build this new ecosystem focused around people. How do we be more purposeful and do it along the way to create? I So I lived in a community where we did not have a grocery store, right? And we call that a food desert. While we're building the new energy ecosystem, let's not create clean energy deserts. Mm. Right. How can we see the 
Uh, well, this is very exciting about your follow-up and collaboration since you guys are neighbors <laughs> in Atlanta. Um, we are going to shift the conversation. Uh, you've identified some great challenges, and I'm sure you guys are all thinking about them and how it affects your work, your sectors, um, where you're from, the communities that you live in. Um, I'd like to talk about, as we transition to the clean energy economy, what are the biggest opportunities that you see? And do you have any successful case studies that you know about where people were able to come together across their differences to achieve a clean energy transition? Can I go? All right, all right. So I'm excited about this question. I think we have the opportunity for economic inclusion oh. as we create this new energy ecosystem. And one thing, example I like to use is Southern Company was one of the founding members of something called Energy Impact Partners, which is kind of a VC type opportunity where you would invest in new technology companies because as utilities, we are technology consumers. So we buy technology to serve our customers. So it was, how can we put capital to work to create new companies? And along that way, some leaders within the company said, I don't think we're being inclusive enough. And they started a new fund called the Elevate Fund, which was utilities coming together, creating a venture fund specifically to invest in diverse companies mm. to help them be more included in this new energy ecosystem that we're going to create as we combat climate change. So we had a senior executive for Southern who actually left the company because he was so passionate about this topic. And now he leads that fund. His name is Anthony Oney. Uh, he grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. And now he is leading this fund with Energy Impact Partners, trying to put capital to work for people like you, Robert. So you talk, you and I talked earlier about you being a creative, and I agree with you. How can we get more diverse people involved early and that they are funded so that they can pursue opportunities? I love that because clearly I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a beneficiary, so I'm biased towards this action. <laughs> we never talked about this before coming here for all those that are wondering. Uh, yeah, I think for me, right, uh, I, I like to share my perspective in stories, right? So sort of four stories linked to what I said earlier. One of the examples I gave earlier was the smallholder cacao farmer. How if the rain is a month late, high yield is down by 40%. Uh, at the same time, while in Ghana, I spent three years living in the bush with the farmers to try and understand how they work. I met a farmer by the name of Joseph. Joseph lived on the border of Ghana and Ivory Coast. It's called the cocoa jungle. They grow 15% of the world's cocoa. And he had uh, seven children, right? And he was one of the lucky few that was able to get a loan from a microfinance company to buy this solar powered irrigation system, right? So it was a Dutch company that financed the microfinance, and I think the solar system was from a German company. And Joseph, with his uh, 25 hectares of cacao, was able to pay for all of his children's school fees, including university tuition, right? When I left Joseph in 2019, his oldest son was finishing medical school in Cuba. Education is the biggest tool out of poverty for many of these people, right? And so this so an economic use of energy is what helped him. So how can we then ensure that there are a whole bunch of Josephs walking around, right? That's number one in Agri. And as I mentioned, Agri is 80% of this continent's uh, population. The second story is tied to uh, affordable housing. Affordable housing is a huge issue. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I started a credit scoring company, and that company is now being used by Old Mutual in South Africa. It's the biggest insurance company, and they are doing affordable housing programs for people in Soweto. Soweto is the famous shanty towns where Mandela marched. People live in tin shacks. People are paying rent on a monthly basis for 40 years, and they still live in a four room tin shack. And so, what our credit scoring company is using alternative methods to show them being credit worthy. 
and Old Mutual has committed seven and a half million dollars to do 300 mortgages over the next three years. What I'm trying to convince Old Mutual is South Africa has a huge load shading problem. I visited there in March. You have people living in million dollar houses and they're sitting in the dark for six hours because of the grid. And so what I'm trying to work with Old Mutual is when you do this affordable housing program, slap a solar panel on top. It's simple. For $15,000, someone can have five kilowatts of power. Five kilowatts is enough to power a nice size home in San Francisco. You understand? So sort of that is the second example. The third example I'll give is around embracing bold technology. I'll give the cell phone as an example. So uh, in 1996, we all still use landlines. Mo Ibrahim brought the cell phone to Africa and suddenly my grandmother in the village can afford it. Why? Because 90% of the cost was in the wiring and infrastructure. You remove that, it's affordable. The same is true for energy. I did solar microgrids in, in, for farmers in Ghana and 80% of the cost was in the wiring. I have classmates at Stanford that have a wireless electricity company. I don't mean wireless as in Apple where you put it down, but where an entire house is powered wirelessly. Imagine if you remove 90% of the cost of energy. Suddenly, it becomes as ubiquitous as the cell phone. So how do we embrace that bold technology? And my last example is around being sort of proactive. I have an AI company that uses imagery to predict uh, risks related to extreme weather events. Which tree is gonna hit the power line where? How many customers are gonna lose power for how long? So we are stuck in this place of being very reactive. But AI and machine learning is mature enough that using something as simple as a Siri type user interface, my company has a conversation interface, non-technical people can ask, hey, on the island of Fiji, what's gonna be the impact of the cyclone? And Google actually now has a program where they model the risks of communities and they give grants beforehand for people to either be displaced or become resilient themselves. So Dr. Barry talked about something important, putting people at the center of this. Power companies have something called risk spend efficiency. That is where every year they plan what are the risks and the growth we need to do next year and how do we justify our electricity tariffs. We need a new power plant, we need a new grid. And that's upon saying, this is the growth we need, these are the risks, this is the money we need. A concept that came to mind was, why don't we all here adopt something called a just spend efficiency? So that we, in the same financial planning we do for the systems, we also include people. How do we justify the social returns of our technological growth and innovation? This concept of a just spend efficiency, I think is something that could potentially work because there's a lot we can learn from the current system of the risk spend efficiency. So just, so I want to talk houses. Okay. So you mentioned affordable housing and you talked about housing as a way to Yes. Right. So I'd like to tell a story about my family so my grandfather, his name was Marion Lucius Nail, and he was a carpenter. Now I'm an engineer and I'm the first engineer in my family, but I really think that Marion Lucius Nail was the first engineer, but because of you know, what was going on in our country at the time, he could not go study engineering. One of the things that he did was that he built his family home from scratch, right? Now that home still stands, and someone is living in that home, but it's built from scrap material. So recyclable a, material. I'm not even talking. I'm just talking scraps. Somebody, some, that somebody had to live in. Yeah. And he built that home, and it recently sold. It's in Charleston, South Carolina. It sold for half a million dollars. So it just blows my mind that something that my grandfather built sold for something like that. I also think about my uncle Woodrow. Right? So in Birmingham, same story. <laughs> house built from scraps. My grandfather, Simpson Berry, <laughs> same story. His family home. So these homes are still standing and they are not energy efficient. So I think about all the systems in the United States where we created substandard home infrastructure 
for so many people that is still being used. So you talked about putting a solar roof on the power. In some instances, I think we need to think about energy efficiency for the home and how do we do that cost effectively. Because if you live in the South, you're going to be running your air conditioner quite a bit. I'm sure you run your air conditioner all the time. And if your home does not have a good envelope, then it's not going to be energy efficient. So we need affordable housing for sure. But somehow as a society, we have to go back and address the housing that still exists, that is substandard that people are living in. And they talked about that energy poverty. I think much of that comes from this inefficiency of the envelope of the home. So I think we need to think about that as a society. How can we remedy that history in, in our country? New affordable homes, but how do we go back and address the existing? So I am an impromptu Jesse. <laughs> I mean, so I think we have a was, yeah, I was going to say, I think this should be time for Q&A right now. Go right ahead. Uh, well, Dr. Maria is, uh, is um, helping our, our wonderful hostess. I wanted to ask how you guys are communicating to those that might be more centered around a capitalistic mentality, social justice investments. In, in other words, from my perspective, I see that the global climate problem is a global problem. We need to bring up all communities. But for those that are really interested in making strong financial investments, how do we communicate them to be more long-term thinking in their investments? How do you save the planet and still make money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For me, I think it's value-based, so you have to show the complete value of the investment, not necessarily the, the short term. I think that, look, there will be companies that think short term, uh, so I don't think we can get around that, but I do think there are companies that are interested in the long term. Uh, so I had an opportunity this year to testify before the Georgia Public Service Commission and we talked about my testimony was about climate risk right and that was the first time that our company in a public proceeding like that talked about had a witness talk about climate risk bringing that forward saying look we use it in our modeling right we need to think about how we are transitioning our fleet to think about carbon and what the potential cost of carbon. So we, previous speaker talked about Waxman and Markey. And if you look in Congress, there are always a bill talking about carbon tax. So I think when we're doing our planning, right, as companies, you talked about our planning process, that we have to include that climate risk in the planning scenario. And you have to do it consistently over a long period of time so that you can communicate to society and to an elected official that this is a financial risk that we're going to have to manage. So there is, hey, we want the cheapest resource today. I think there was a discussion earlier about solar and wind now being one of the more cheaper resources. We're gonna need other resources and they're gonna to have to have a value proposition. But in terms of planning, I think we have to include carbon as a risk so that it makes it into that financial amount. And to add, to add a use case, right, really quickly, 20 seconds. Uh, so for example, the, the number that comes to mind is the urban heat island effect, i.e. not having enough trees in low-income neighborhoods, costs the city of Los Angeles $100 million a year. That is money that the, the, the city could be keeping in their pockets if they put more trees in low-income neighborhoods. Simple as day. So being able to help them understand those benefits, I think does incentivize them with what matters to them, which is financial incentives, but also it helps the continent and the planet. I'll give your name and then your question. Uh, I don't have a question per se. I'm just going to go on Dr. Barry's military comments um, on that.
of our partnerships with communities and um, our with, and community engagement. And so we're going to have far greater success with this. Um, just want to give a plug for the Holistic Health Center. <laughs> there was a vision to the day today, and I really like benefited greatly from it. A team of people just helped me through what was a non-stop cough. <laughs> and thank you so much to Sierra. Uh, we'll have one more question. We do have to transition to the next panel, but I definitely want to make sure that um, we hear from you. Thanks, Lou. I, I just wanted to take the opportunity uh, listening to some of the challenges that you mentioned around electric cars. Mm -hmm. And I guess clarifying at the beginning that obviously we need to do everything we can for climate change and electric vehicles are a big part of that. So certainly not against electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. But what our company does, and here with, with Meg, is uh, is e-fuels, and a lot of people actually haven't heard about what e-fuels are. It's a relatively new development, but we are bringing our first pilot plant into operation this year. So we were producing our first liters of e-fuel in Chile at the end of this year. And we have a very large industrial facility that's being planned for the United States to start construction next year, which would produce 12,000 barrels per day of e-fuel. And e-fuel is basically where you take renewable energy, you produce green hydrogen, but again, some of the challenges that you mentioned around hydrogen, well, what do we do with it? We don't have infrastructure that's ready to burn hydrogen yet. And so we take atmospheric carbon dioxide and we recycle it, combining it with the green hydrogen to make a fuel which is chemically identical to fossil fuels and can do everything that is done with petroleum today, but on a renewable basis tomorrow. So it's basically a way of recycling carbon to have a fossil fuel substitute but which is actually exactly the same as fossil fuels. So any of us who don't have Teslas, <laughs> which seems to be the majority, <laughs> would be able to drive into a gas station tomorrow and fill up our cars with carbon neutral e-gasoline um, and immediately start uh, decarbonizing the world. And so we are one company. We've, we've got a big plans to do gigawatts and gigawatts of renewable energy and turn that into um, turn that into carbon neutral e-fuels by the end of this decade. Um, I'm sure there'll be other companies like us taking this up as well, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to talk about it because it also touches on a couple of the just energy transition points that we've mentioned as well. One, because it provides a new sector for people who are currently working in oil and gas to move across with jobs that are relevant to their knowledge and, and work history. And we actually have that in our company. Um, a lot of people who previously worked in the oil and gas sector are now working for us in, in, in our company. And it also touches on the just energy transition in terms of access to a decarbonizing transport fuel. Because for all of the reasons that you've mentioned, it is a big challenge to transition the transport sector in many places across to electric, where they're already struggling to get electricity to people for their basic needs. Um, and so this is a way that people can start to decarbonize the transport sector using all of the existing uh, distribution networks, vehicles and everything else that are already there. Mm -hmm. Progressively, we can introduce more and more e-fuels into the system and help people to decarbonize. So thanks. I, I have customers for you. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you to Dr. Barry, to Rob, Kibera, um, I will take the moment to do a shameless plug. Uh, I'm going to be passing around these postcards 
There's a QR code behind the postcard that explains what we're going to be working on at dream.org. Uh, but you'll also get a chance to meet our Green for All Business Council, which is all black and brown CEOs across the country, deeply committed to the clean energy transition and to making it equitable and something that creates workforce opportunities as well as makes disadvantaged communities better. And so um, I hope that you'll be able to collaborate because it was in actually working with Rob and really for me, from a government perspective and now a social justice perspective, knowing that we have the talent, the ingenuity, the solutions they're within our communities and how do you actually lift those up and create visibility for those. And so we hope that dream.org will be able to play a role in that. And again, to see future collaborations like the one we magically saw happen here between the two Atlanta neighbors. So thank you so much and I'll transition it back to Quill.